All right. Well, we are live this morning, and we are on the air. Faith Baptist Church, I'm Brother Brandon Teague, and we want to invite everybody in that's listening to us on the Internet as we've got people. I know it seems hard to believe sitting here in this building in Bogota, Texas, that we got people that will listen to us in New Zealand, but we do. There's people listen to us in New Zealand. There's people listen to us in England. There's people that listen to us in, in Denmark that we know of. And uh, and people listen to us all over this country. And uh, a lot of people don't have a church to go to. And uh, they're looking for a church that preaches the truth. And that's what we aim to do this morning is preach the truth. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 verse through 24. Let's read this morning. The Bible says in the 70s, returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Jesus sent them out to go and preach the gospel. And they came back telling him, said, Lord, them devils, they, 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 would, they wouldn't mess with us because of who you are. Do you see that? It's because of who you are. He said, they're subject unto us through thy name. Because we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, the devils couldn't, they couldn't overrule us. And he said unto them, listen to this, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. The Bible tells us over in, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, I believe it is, but I didn't get that backwards. The uh, Bible says, Oh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? which did weaken the nations. Lucifer, Satan, the Lord is talking about his fall from heaven here, and he said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Somebody might read that and say, Well, how come people get hurt? You know, I don't believe Jesus was talking about our physical flesh. I believe he's talking about our soul, our spirit. Nothing that the devil can do can take away that part of a child of God. Yes, the devil, the devil may bring things on us in our life that cause us physical harm or suffering, but the devil can't change what God has done in us. Amen? He said, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. He said, don't rejoice because you had power over the enemy. But listen to what he says. He says he said that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I'm going to tell you something. I'm thankful this morning that I'm saved. I'm thankful this morning that when I came to Jesus Christ as a sinner, humbly before him, bringing, bringing my sinful self before him and laying myself down before him at his altar, and say to him, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need to be clean. I want you to save me and wash my sins away. I'm thankful that he didn't say to me, no, you're too dirty, or no, you're not the right type, or no, you're not the right color, or you're not the right gender, or you're not the right age. He said none of that. All he did was forgive my sin. Wash me clean. And, I, and, and thank God, look here, thank God, it, thank God I believe this Bible which tells me that my sins are gone. They're washed away forever. Nothing can, listen to me, the devil can't uncover them again and show God because once they're gone, they're gone. Amen? And listen, he said that we should rejoice over those things. That means we should have some joy in our life. If you don't have any joy in your life this morning, can I tell you something? All you got to do is go back and revisit the fact that God has washed your sins away. Listen, maybe that ain't no big deal to you, but it's a big deal to me. Amen? Maybe you ain't thought about the impact of that. I think that's part of, part of part, the problems of people today. And we don't understand, we don't think about the impact of our sin. Our sin made us an enemy of God. Our sin had us on a one-way trip to hell for all eternity, never to come out of it. I mean, we were literally on our way to hell. And that has been changed forevermore. Nothing ever can put us back on that road again. Listen, Jesus has forgiven us and cleansed us once and for all and forevermore. And because of that, amen. I wish they'd come in, don't you? Amen. amen. Listen, because of that, nothing can ever put me back on that road to hell. Amen. Because Jesus changed all that for me. And because of that, I want to give him 
the joy. I want him to see the joy in me. Amen. I want him to hear the praise out of me. I want the Lord to know that I'm thankful for what he's done for me. Amen. Listen, it wasn't for me that he did that. Understand that. You say, wait a minute, preacher. I thought he died for me. I thought he forgave my sins. He did, but understand something. He didn't do that for you. He did that for himself. Amen? He redeemed us for himself. We're his people. He bought us for himself. You say, wait, he did it for me. He did it for you because of himself. He wanted us for himself. Amen? And so we all rejoice in that, that he loved us enough to come to where we were and give us what we could not have and we could not manufacture that we might be his. Amen? I praise God for that. And not only that, listen, he's not forgetful either. Amen? And just for the record, our names are written down in a book in heaven called the Lamb's Book of Life. Who's the Lamb? That's Jesus. Amen? What life are we talking about? That's eternal life. And he's got our names written down in that Book of Life. The Bible says, verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Jesus did not come and reveal himself to those who were in religious power. He didn't come and join the ruling elite. Jesus came to those who who knew nothing. Jesus came to those who had nothing, who amounted to nothing as far as this world's eyes are concerned. The little people, the people that didn't seem important, those are the ones he revealed himself to. And I'm going to tell you something today. You may not think you're much, but God thought you were something. He revealed himself to you. He showed you that you needed Jesus. He gave you the salvation that you needed, even though you didn't realize you needed it. Hallelujah. What a Savior we have. Amen. Amen. Verse 22, our text verse this morning. Jesus made this statement. He said, all things are delivered to me of my Father. That simply means God says, Jesus, it's all yours, and I'm going to give it all to you. Amen? That's exactly what that means. And he said, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son. Now you say, now wait a minute. So the Father is the only one who knows Jesus, who Jesus is, and Jesus is the only one who knows who the Father is. He says, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. There's lots of people in this world who think they know God. Okay? There's lots of people, there's people all over this world who will tell you that, that, that our God and that this person that they call Allah are the same, but they're not. Listen to me. God is not a God of, of, of death. God's a God of life. Amen? God is not a God of, 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 of just uh, absolute uh, filth and perversion. And, and listen, God's none of that. God is light. Him is no darkness at all. Neither shadow of turning. Listen, just because somebody calls something God doesn't mean it's God. He said, to whom the Son will reveal him. There are people, and I hate to tell you this, but there are people over in Israel this morning who know God. They said they know God, but they don't know Jesus. And they can't know God unless they know Jesus, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if you reject Jesus, you can't find the Father. There is no coming to God the Father but through Jesus Christ, the Son. He says he has to reveal him. Amen? And he said, and he turned unto him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things which ye see. And I will say to you this morning, Blessed are your eyes because you see the things that you see. He said, For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And I'll say that to you again this morning. Sitting around here this morning in this building, I want to tell you that you realize you don't realize how blessed you are. There have been people for there were for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of of years who, who, who looked into these things to find out, tried to understand these things, but could not. And you and I have it right in front of us. Why? Because of Jesus. Because the Lord Jesus has revealed to us who the Father is. Amen. All, everything that has been done 
is done for Christ. Amen. All things are delivered to me of my Father. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us this morning as we meet together. Lord, as we study the scripture, as we dig into it. Lord, I pray, Father, for each one that's come this morning. Lord, that you'll grant to us understanding above all things. Lord, I pray that you touch our hearts and open our our understanding of these things. Lord, I pray for the young people in here this morning. Lord, that the reality of the things that we're talking about, Lord, that it would that it would appear before their mind's eye. Lord, that they see it. Lord, that it would sink in. That they that they have, as Jesus said, ears to hear. Lord God, that it become real to them. Father, that they understand their purpose and their place in this world. Lord, that we all do. Lord, each one that listens in this morning, that we might understand our place and who we are to, to you, Father, and what you want from our life. Lord, help us realize, Lord, that we're here for you. And, Lord, I pray, Father, that we'll live accordingly. Give us the grace and the power to do so. Lord, we can do nothing without you, Jesus. We praise you and we give you glory. We thank you now in Christ's name. Preach the message through me, your servant, this morning. Holy Ghost, take control of me. Just fill me and use me. Pour me out for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, again, all things are delivered to me of my Father. That's what Jesus told us. And so God has given everything to him. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 15 this morning. John 15. We're going to turn a few places this morning as we... Look at this message. That it's all for him. All for Jesus. Everything is for him. We are for him. Amen. And when you say for him, I don't mean, hey, we're rooting for him. Listen, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Amen. He's done He's done conquered death. Amen. He's conquered sin and death. He's sat down. His work is finished. Amen. I don't mean we're for him like we're for a sports team. I mean, all things are for his use. All things belong to him. Everything is for his purpose. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen? It's all for him. John chapter 15 this morning with me. I want you to know that we are here for him. Listen to me. as branches to bear fruit for him. Let's look at it. John chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. That means God the Father is the farmer. Amen? That's what it means. Hey, Jesus said, I'm the vine, and my father's the farmer. Amen? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. I thought about that a lot of times. Oh, and all of us in here probably at one time has raised tomatoes, most of us, not everybody in here has. But when you're raising tomatoes, first thing I learned about it is when you see a tomato vine, this, uh, branches coming out when they start growing, any of them that doesn't have any blooms on them, you can break them off because they're not ever going to produce any tomatoes. And all they're going to do is take up, take up uh, space and take up the energy and, and, and take up all the, the water and everything else, and they're not necessary because they're not going to bear fruit. And so the more of those you get out of the way, the more fruit you're going to bear. And the Lord said, every branch, he said, every branch in me that beareth my fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, he's taking away things that don't belong there why? So that we can bring forth more fruit. Now, why are we to bring more for, for, forth more fruit? Because the Lord deserves it. That's why. Amen. Jesus died and shed his blood on Calvary so that the world might be saved through him, and yet the world is not being saved through him. Why is that? That's because we're not bearing the fruit. You and I are to bear the fruit. You and I are to produce the fruit. You and I are to reach the law. You and I are to preach to the law. You and I are to teach the law. Amen? And let him draw them and let him bring them to, to Christ, but you and I are to bring the, me- bring the message to the lost. All right, verse 3 he said, Now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me. That means spend time with God every single day you live. Get to know him. Get to know what he wants. Get to know uh, what he desires from you. Get to know what he has for you. Get to know the promises he's made to you. 
Get close to him. Abide in him. And he said, in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, you can't be religious and please God. That's what that means. You can't manufacture what God expects on your own. You cannot. He said, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. You can take one of them tomato branches off that, that vine, Mr. Dodd, and you and you take it, and, and it's got blooms on it, maybe even got a little green tomato on it. You break it off and say, bring it out and say, look what I got. It ain't going to make a tomato. Amen? It's got to be in the vine. If it's going to receive the, the things from the soil, if it's going to receive uh, everything that it needs to produce, it's got to be in the vine. This, if we plan to be anything as Christians for God, we have got to be in the vine. Amen? We've got to spend time, look up here, with Jesus Christ. You can't expect everything to happen just because you're a Christian. You've got to spend time with God. You've got to spend time with Him on purpose. You've got to seek Him. You've got to go to Him and say, Lord, I want to spend time with you today. Amen? We all understand it's not that hard. If we want to spend time with somebody in this world, we have to go to them and say, hey, I'd like to spend some time with you. Let's sit down and talk. Let's visit. Why, why shouldn't it be it's the same with God? God wants us to come to him and visit with him, tell him everything that's on our heart, tell him everything that's in our, it's in our life that's, that's troubling us or that's blessing us for that matter. God wants to hear about it all. He wants us to spend time with him, and then he wants to spend time with us by speaking to us through his word and teach us how to please him, teach us how to live a life that's meaningful, how to live a life that brings reward in the end when we see him face to face. That's what he wants. He wants us to understand how to get what we need in this life from him. Because if we will seek him, not this world, not the money of this world, not the influence and the power of this world, the popularity of this world, and the things of this world, to satisfy our soul, which can never satisfy us. It will never satisfy. It will only satisfy for a short time, and these things leave. Everything I've ever gotten tried to hold on to slipped through my fingers. This world is like that. But I can tell you, if we will root ourselves in Jesus Christ and, and seek that relationship from him as branches, he will produce the fruit in us. Amen? He says, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. You hear that? Much fruit. Now you have to ask yourself, am I bringing forth much fruit? Probably not, because we probably need to be rooted in a little closer to Jesus, don't we? Amen? We probably need to realize that we're not as close to him as we ought to be. He says, for without me, you can do nothing. That means he's telling us we're wasting our life without him. We're wasting an opportunity. Listen, we're wasting an opportunity to, to have reward in heaven. We're throwing it away. Throwing it away. He wants us to have it. That's the thing. We're not being greedy about trying to have reward in heaven. God wants us to have it. He urges us to have it. But the only way we're going to have it is if we have such a relationship with him now and we, and we seek to please him now. All right, I'm going to skip down to verse 8 so I can hurry up and get on this message. But he says, Herein is my Father glorified. This brings God glory. What does? That you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So God's saying, if we're going to follow him, then we have to bear fruit. If we're going to please him, we need to do something that's well, let me just put it to you like this. You say a man went to work for a company selling selling a product. Let's say he was selling. Uh, uh, let's say he was selling. Somebody give me something. I'm one totally blank. Uh, floor cleaner. All right. Let's say he went to selling floor cleaner. Thank you, Mama. That was great. But he went to he went to work for a company selling floor cleaner. And let's say he rode around all day long. And, and, and knocked on a lot of doors, talked to a lot of people, but he never sold one jug of floor cleaner. At the end of his pay period, guess what he's going to get? A zero. Because he didn't go to work for that company, just walk around and talk to people and, 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 and have a good conversation with them. That's not what he went to work to do. He went to work 
to sell floor cleaner. Listen to me. We came into the family of God. We didn't come into the family of God to coach. We didn't come into the family of God to just sit on our blessed assurance and wait on Jesus to come get us. He told us that we are to bear fruit. Why? Because he didn't save us to sit around and do nothing because that would be us living for us. Right? We're just living for us, waiting on him to take us to our eternal reward. No, we're to be here working for him while we are waiting on him to come and get us, for, to take us to our eternal reward. Why? Because everything that we do for him gives him glory, and it's all for him. Number two, listen to me. We are as light. Turn to Matthew. We, we're all for him. We're to be lights for him. Matthew chapter chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 14. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to those who came seeking after him, those who were his disciples, he said to them, he said, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. If you're driving across the desert, and you come up on a, a city that's it's up on an elevated plain, and all the lights are up there up on top of it. You can't hide from it. I mean, it won't hide from you. It's there. It'll be a, a bright light in the middle of vast nothingness. There's no way to miss it. I mean, it's there. It's shining before you. You go out at night in the, country, in the countryside and look up. It's impossible to miss all them stars over your head. Amen. They are, they are so far away. Don't nobody know how far away they are. But yet you can't help but see them if the sky is clear. Lights shine. They draw attention. Especially against the black sky at night. Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. I don't think I have to express to you too hard how dark this world is. It's dark. It's pitch black darkness. This world is in is in love with, with wickedness. This world is, is cheering for iniquity. This world is sick. It's upside down. It's everything's turned on its head. We're living in what what used to be called a dystopia. That's a world where everything is wrong and mixed up. That's the world we live in today in 2016. Everything is darkness. So in this vast darkness, if, if, if you and I would draw near to God, if you and I would, would put down all of the things that keep us from coming to Him and putting ourselves at His throne and, and, and under His Mercy coming with with humility in us and realizing how much we so greatly need God. If we would come and put ourselves in His mercy and say, Oh Lord, I live in a dark world. Oh Lord, I live in a world that's so filled with sin. And Lord, I don't want to go through this world and let this world put out the light that you've lit in me. I don't want it to be covered up. You see here in verse 15, he said, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. He's talking about a basket, a bushel basket. You light that candle, and then you put something on top of it, can't nobody see it shining. He said, Men don't do that. They put it on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Folks, we're living in this old dark world. And if, if, one, if, if one of us would just get on fire for God, Lord, lighten my darkness. Lord, please, can I tell you something? Here's where the source of the fire comes from, right here in this book. If we get in this book and we get close to God, listen, we'd be like Jeremiah, talking about his word like a fire shut up in my bones. Our God is a consuming fire, the Bible tells us. And if we'll get near his presence, he will light our soul on fire. And if he lights our soul on fire, we will shine for him. 
We won't be worried about what anybody thinks about whether or not we're excited about being being a child of God. We won't worry about if anybody likes what we're saying as we talk about the Lord to them. We're not going to worry about whether we hurt somebody's feelings that thinks that they're that, that God don't exist. We're not going to worry about whether some Muslim somewhere uh, gets offended because we're talking about Jesus Christ. Listen, we won't care if somebody don't like it because we were not called to worry about whether or not they like it. We're not called to be concerned about whether or not people are offended by the message of the gospel. We're called to shine. Amen? Listen, People, people turn lights on all the time. Listen, they, they're not worried about whether people want to be in the dark or not. They need a light. They, they, listen, they turn the light on. And this world needs the light. They don't know they need light. They need Christ. And the Bible tells us in Matthew five sixteen, let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, what does that really mean? That means you've got to let Jesus be real in your life. You've got to let him have first place. You've got to let him lead you. Get out of God's way. Let God lead. Follow his word. And get, take his word as the leadership of your life. Govern your life by what he has taught us. Amen. Don't do it your way. Don't follow your friends. Don't follow your kin folks. Don't follow this world pattern. Follow God. Shine for Him. Live for Him. As, as you speak the truth, the Word of God needs to not just come forth from your lips, but people need to be able to look and see your life, that your life backs up what your lips are saying, and as they see those things, two, two things put together, they say, wait, God's real. They're not just saying it. They're living by it. And if they see us living by it, they can't help but say, this has got to work or they wouldn't be able to make it like that. There's something to this. And the Holy Spirit of God, hey, takes that testimony of a child of God. And he takes that and he makes that person who's seeking realize, hey, wait a minute, that God truly has shown up in their life. God's real. And what he says is true. The Holy Spirit of God takes us. We're a, test, we're a testimony. Amen. We testify. We witness. We've seen it. We've felt it. We've lived it. We know it. He's ours. We like to shine to show that God is real. Why are we to do that? So that others may come to Christ because it's all for Him. Amen. Number three. Turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. I say it's all for him. All for him we are to be. We're to be witnesses. I know I just covered that, but let's look at it in Scripture. Luke chapter 24, verse 46 through 48. Luke chapter 24, verse 46 through 48. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Now, folks, let me say something to you right now. There's lots of people in this world who's trying, who are trying to preach Christ, but you know what? They're leaving out part of the message. He just told us the message there in verse 47. He said, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. But yet there are people who are preaching, God died... God sent Jesus, Jesus died for sinners, and anybody that wants him can come and pray a prayer and ask him into their heart. Sounds like that's the gospel, but wait a minute, hold on, hold everything. Why are they coming? What are they coming to get? See, I think a lot of people are told, come to Jesus, get salvation, come to Jesus, 
Ask him to be your Savior, and they don't even understand what a Savior is. There's lots of people that have been told to ask Jesus into their heart. They don't even understand what they're doing. The Bible says that repentance and remission of sin should be preached. Repentance means you have got to turn to God. You have got to realize that you're sinning against a holy and righteous God and you must realize that that sin is what's separating you from God. That sin is what makes you the enemy of God. And once you realize that, you've got to turn to Him from that. You can't keep going on your way and ignoring God. Turn to Him. He's your only hope. Repentance means I can't go my own way and find God. I have to turn from my way and turn to God. And the only way that our sins can be remitted or blotted out or forgiven is to have the one thing that can do that, and that's the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says you're witnesses of these things. I'm a witness. I witnessed it. November 1st, 1975, I witnessed it for myself. I witnessed it when I, kneeled in, when, I, when I knelt in prayer and I called upon the name of the only begotten Son of God. I witnessed it when the burden of sin was lifted off of me and I knew that I had been forgiven. I witnessed it that night. Amen? How many of us in here have witnessed that same thing? Okay? You know what? Then that means every one of us in here have an obligation to tell others what happened to us. That's what it says. He said we should preach it everywhere. Said, Wait a minute, I'm not a preacher. You don't have to have a, a degree from a Bible college to be a preacher. I don't have a degree anyway. Didn't want one. Listen, you don't have to have a suit and a tie. I ain't got one on this morning. Amen? You know, I'm not a pastor of a church. You don't have to be a pastor of a church. Listen, every one of us are called to be witnesses. There is no nothing in this these passages of Scripture saying anything about pastoral credentials. It's talking to believers. The Bible says ye are witnesses of these things. What did Peter, James, and John say when they were out doing the very thing that, that, that God is telling us to do here? They were out doing it there in Jerusalem, and the religious people found them there, and they brought them in before the religious court, and they said, these guys are out here preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, and they took them, and they tied them up, and they whipped them, and they told them, don't you ever go back out there and do that again. And what did they say before the, 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 the appointed religious governmental officials of the day who were in charge and in power who told them not to do it anymore, told them you're breaking the law, did they say, oh, well, we better obey the law of the land. Okay, we won't say anything else. No, they looked them suckers right in the eye. They looked at them greedy eyeballs and they said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, it doesn't matter what you say, fellas. We're going to be witnesses anyway because it ain't all for you it's all for him. Amen? This to me. This world can tell you anything it wants to. These greedy, corrupt, filthy, rotten, despicable, and any, y'all want to throw any more adjectives in, politicians in Washington, D.C. can come up with any executive orders or rulings or laws or anything they want to to try to make you be quiet and hush, but it does not matter. God said it's not for them, it's all for Jesus. And that's why we must be witnesses no matter who likes it or who don't. All right, turn to John 13. John chapter 13. It's all for him. We're to be all in for him as servants. John chapter 13, verse 14 through 17. Jesus said, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye all also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, Happy are you if you do them. There's a lot of stuff in that right there. First of all, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. 
the washing of the feet has a significance. Because you understand, in the day that Jesus and his disciples were living in, they, of course they lived, they lived in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, if you've never, I've never been there, but I've seen enough to know, it's a sandy place. It's a dusty place. In the days of time they were living in, they weren't near paved roads like they are today. Everywhere they went was a dirt road or a dirt trail, some kind of a dirt something. Uh, they walked and they got dirty feet. So when it was custom when you entered into somebody's house uh, for that person to wash your feet, they washed one. And this Jesus taught them uh, they gave or they gave them water to wash their own feet, but Jesus washed their feet, and he did so to show them something. Listen, you need to get the filth of the world off of you. Amen? We may be saved from the sin of this world, but we still have to walk in this world. Amen? And as we walk in this world, we are going to get next to evil. We're going to get next to filth. We're going to get next to corruption. We are going to get next to all the garbage of this world. You can't help but hear it. You can't help but see it. Amen. Listen, the Bible talks about about being vexed with seeing and hearing the unrighteous deeds of the wicked on a daily basis. It will wear on you. So therefore, what we have to do is get that filth off of us. Amen. And Jesus said. As I have as I have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. He said, I've given you this, this is an example that you go and do what I've done to you. So folks, listen, it's, it's our duty as believers to remind others around us that we are to be clean for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. So what what do we wash their feet with? I know you didn't ask that, but I'll ask it for you. What do we wash? What do we wash something with? What the Bible tells us that we're to have a, use the washing of water by the word. Am I to literally take off Mister Dodd's boots, his socks, and take out scrub brush and some soap and wash his feet in here today? No, that's not what we're talking about. But you know what? The word of God will wash. The word of God, the water, the water of the word of God. If we are, if let me just say this: How are you going to do it if you don't read it? How are you going to How are you going to do what Christ has commanded you to do if you don't know the word of God? It's so so important that we read the word of God, that we study the word of God, that we learn the word, of God, that we meditate upon it, that we hide it in our heart, so that we're able to use it when needed. Amen. I mean, listen, it, it would do no good to buy to buy a person who don't know how to use tools, to buy them a, a big old tool set, and they don't even know the first thing about them. Couldn't do them any good. Listen, it doesn't do you any good to have a Bible sitting on your coffee table that you never open. It won't do you any good sitting there as a paperweight. But if we will get into it and study it every day, if we'll let the Word of God become a part of our life, then when we get around somebody else who's been walking through the dirt of this world, you say, well, how do I know if they need help? You can tell. You can tell. You know how you can tell? Because the dirt's showing up in their life. Amen? Shows up the way they act. Shows up the way they talk. Shows up the things they allow in their life. God wants us as brothers and sisters in the same family to care enough about one another to use the Word of God, not our opinion, not our feelings, but the Word of God to instruct, to help, to clean one another. Amen? And the Bible says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do this. God didn't say, watch out, because some people may not like it. No, he said, you just you do it. Amen? The Bible says you're happy if you do it. It don't necessarily say they're going to love you for it, because some people get an attitude when you try to tell them anything. But God didn't say, do it for them. God said, do it for me. Amen? You do that for them as you're doing it for me. Amen? Do it. I set the example. You follow me. Amen? Number five. Everything's all for him. Turn to First Peter. First Peter. 
We'll get over in just a second. Turn fast. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two, verses eleven and twelve. We are not only servants for him, but the Bible tells us that we're pilgrims for him. As pilgrims. Kids, y'all know what they call you know why they call the people who came to America pilgrims? You ever thought about that? Why they were called the pilgrims? That wasn't their last name. Now, I know both pilgrims down there in down there in uh, Pittsburgh chicken plants, but that's not the pilgrims we're talking about. They were called pilgrims because they left a place seeking a country they'd never been to. That's what a pilgrim is. Someone who's seeking a country. The Bible tells us in in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, 12, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, that means I plead with you, as strangers and pilgrims. Why do you call them strangers? We don't belong in this world. We're not of this world. This world is not our home. We sing that song. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. All right? We don't belong here. We're strangers here. We don't fit with the world that's, that's, that's being talked about today. Listen to me. We don't, we don't go for all this sodomite garbage and abortion and, and, and liquor and, and dope and filth and perversion. That's not, that's not what we're seeking after. We're looking for a place where there is no sin. Amen? So we're headed for a country, folks. This is not the end of the road. This is just this is just the place we're trying to get through to get to our final destination. We're to be pilgrims. He said, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, Glorify God in the day of visitation. Let me just sum that up by saying I'll saying this right here. Never wants us to settle into this whole world. God does not expect us to get comfortable here. Amen. God wants us to always be uncomfortable with this world, but comfortable in his word. Amen. God wants us to find our comfort right here. He is our comforter. Amen. He says that we're to abstain from flesh and lust. We don't belong here. If we get comfortable, if we get it, if we start indulging ourselves in the lust of the flesh in this world, the lust of the flesh, which says, "Hey, I wanna, I wanna do whatever I wanna do. This is my life. Hey, I can do what I want to do." Miss Taylor, can't nobody tell me how to live. This is my my life. I'll do what I want. That's the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, which say. I want to have everything I want to have. Hey, I want it all. I'm going to get mine. That's the lust of the eyes. It says, I'm gimme, gimme, gimme. Money, money, money. Stuff, stuff, stuff. I want it all. Or the pride of life. Which, God help us, it overtakes us. We think we're smarter than everybody else. We think we got it all figured out. Folks, God tells us to abstain. Say, no, 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 no. First of all, it ain't my life to do whatever I want to with. Jesus bought me with his own blood. It's his life that I'm living right here. He's living in me. So it ain't about what I want. Listen, it's not about having all the things that I think I deserve to have because I'm to ask God to provide for my needs, amen, to give me the things I need, not give me every want I've got, amen, to take care of me and keep me humble at the same time so that I don't ever get full of everything I, that, I, that I don't need and think I don't need God. And the pride of life, I need to remember that He is my all in all, that I have nothing outside of Him, that I know nothing outside of Him. Amen? It's all for Him that I'm to abstain from those things which war, the Bible says, against the soul. Those things are an assault against me and keep me from wanting to be close to God. It keeps me from wanting to praise Him. Hey, listen, if, if you ever find me where I don't want to praise God, I can tell you something. 
My flesh is at war against me. You ever find me where I don't feel like reading my Bible? I'm in a war with my flesh. And the same thing happens to you. Amen? Because I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Because I'm His. I need to say no to the things that war against my spiritual life. Why? Because it's all for Him. It's not for me. Number six. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Almost, let's see. Almost where I was going to be at in another message this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. The Bible tells us that we're all for him as soldiers. Mr. Dodd, we talked many times about how you were in Korea. And and we talked about my grandpa being in World War II. And, and we said talked about stuff like that. But we're soldiers for the Lord. And we're called to be soldiers to the Lord. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of his life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. When a man goes off to war, he got to leave everything at home at home. I dare say that it would be, be a very difficult situation for a man who could stay off the cell phone with his wife trying to fight the war. This day and time, that wouldn't surprise me. Somebody hiding out behind a rock talking to their wife, shooting with one hand. That wouldn't shock me at all. Couldn't be a very good soldier. You have to leave some of the comforts to be a soldier. You may have to do without to be a soldier. You may have to take some wounds to be a soldier. You may have to give your life on the battlefield to be a soldier. You certainly give up comfort to be a soldier. The Bible tells us to endure hardness. That means your life ain't going to be easy because you're a Christian. We've had it pretty easy in America. We've had it, well, I think, way easier than anybody would ever dream that Christians would have had it in this world. That easiness is going away. And hardness is settling in. And as it gets harder to be a Christian, we'll find out who the real ones are. Because as it gets hard to, those who were fair-weather Christians will fall by the wayside. But no, God says you have to endure hardness as a good soldier. Amen? There's many of them that's one AWOL. But God says you're going to be a good soldier. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to tolerate that, that, that things ain't always going to go your way. I know a lot of people quote Romans 8, 28 a lot. You know, well, we know all things work together for good to them and love God. Yes, we do. And there's some hard things that come along with loving God. There's some hard things. People will turn their back on you for loving God. People that you love will turn their back on you for loving God. People that you cared about your whole life will walk away from you because of loving God. Because, you see, they'll feel like, you know what? Your love for God gets in the way of our friendship. Your love for God gets in the way of our fellowship. Your love for God gets in the way of my fun. Your love for God makes me feel bad for the things that I want to do in my life. So I can't have anything to do with you. You know what? Some people say, that hurts me. I don't know how to deal with that. Well, God says you're going to have to endure it. Listen, Jesus Jesus had a lot of people following him when he was giving out food. When he was giving out food and healing and doing all this, he had all kinds of people wanting free stuff. But you see, when the free stuff started ending and he started laying it right on the line that this is a matter of heaven and hell, and if you don't listen to my words and you don't accept my words, then you're not going to have heaven, amen? They, like, a lot of people said, oh, well, wait a minute then. We're going on. We'll see you later. The multitudes went away. And that's why he turned to his own disciples in John 6, 66, and said, will you also go away? Listen to me. Jesus endured hardness preaching the gospel his own self. We shouldn't expect no less. We're going to face hardness. But he says, no man that warreth, and we are in a war. Satan is warring against God's people. Satan is bringing it. And he's bringing it hard this day and time against God's people. 
He said, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. This is, and we can go back to Romans 8, 28. The Bible says that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we know that God is working everything in our, for our benefit. Why? Because he wants us to work as soldiers for him. Why? Because we are to do it for Christ. We are the army of the Lord. Who is the Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ. We are in this for him. And we need to realize the seriousness of it, that we are to dedicate ourselves. A good soldier never, never just walks away from his service. A good soldier, and, I, and, I, and I'll say this, Mr. Dodd, I hate to keep bringing you up, but you, you, wear that, you wore that cap in here this morning. What does that cap do? That cap tells of your service. Amen? We ought never forget we're in the army We're in the army of the Lord. You ain't forgot that you're in the army in Korea. Hey, listen, just like that, hey, we, honor, we honor soldiers in this place. Listen, we ought, to be, we ought to honor God's soldiers too. Amen? We ought to encourage one another to keep fighting. We ought to, we ought to find that brothership, that, that, that brotherhood, that kinship, that sisterhood in serving God. Amen. We ought to we ought to we ought to uh, we ought to help that culture along. Amen. We ought to facilitate that culture. We ought to to uh, to work toward getting other people in this battle with us. Because we're here for Jesus. We're not here for us. And lastly, Mark chapter sixteen, and we'll be done this morning. Mark chapter sixteen, verse fifteen through twenty. All for Him. All for him. I said it we're to be all for him as branches to bear fruit. We're to be all for him as lights to shine, as witnesses to testify, as servants to serve, as pilgrims to abstain, as soldiers to fight, and lastly, as workmen to work for him. But you know one great thing about working for Jesus? You work with Jesus. Mark sixteen fifteen and following, he said, and he said unto them, stop right there. And I'm gonna quote, a, I'm gonna quote a preacher, one of the famous messages that, that stirred my heart to serve God. He said, "You don't spell go, p r a y." God commanded us to pray. He told us to pray, but you don't spell go, p r a y. You don't spell go, c o m e. We're supposed to come to church, but coming to church is not going. We're supposed to pray, but praying is not going. He said, and, and, and you don't spell go, G-I-V-E. That's give. You're supposed to give. He said, well, I'm, I give. I give a church. Well, he's told us that we're, to, that we're to give out of our increase, but that's not going. You don't spell go, G-I-V-E. You say, well, I, well, I sing when we come to church. Well, but you don't spell go, S-I-N-G. We're, we're to come and pray and, and give and sing, go to church, but you spell go, G-O, and he says, go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means you can't take the gospel to the wrong person or the wrong place. It's impossible to carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the wrong place, into all the world, to every creature. You can't take it to the wrong person. The Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now let me say, let me stop right there. Let me park on that for just a second. Because the church of Christ will say, now wait a minute, it says you've got to be baptized to be saved. That's not what that says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Doesn't say he believes not and baptized not. The assumption is that when somebody believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll be obedient and follow him in believers' baptism, identifying themselves publicly with Christ who died for their sins. But there ain't no water in this world that's pure enough to wash sins away. Baptism got nothing to do with it. It's being washed in the blood of Jesus. The Bible says, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. 
and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And then the Lord, had, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth. Notice this. The Lord went up, and he sat on the right hand of God. And you know what? That's where he still is. Amen? And the Bible says, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them. God never asked you to do anything that he wouldn't go with you and be your strength and your power while you do it. You might go to work someday for some great big company. Probably ain't likely, but hey, who knows? Somebody in here may go to work someday for some big company. And you'll work for some big boss. But you won't work with the boss because he's the boss. But you go to work for Jesus. The Bible says you work with him. He doesn't send us out to do his work by by ourselves. No, listen, it's important business. It's the most important job in the entire world. President of the United States ain't got no higher calling than you and I have. Hey, listen, the President of the United States can't do the job that you and I do because he doesn't have the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. With the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, you can do things greater than you ever dreamed you could. The Bible says that he'll work with you. Why are we to do it? Because it's for him. He left his home in glory. He took off the robe of his deity. He set that aside. Listen, folks, he is God. Jesus Christ is God. And he took off his deity. He took off his heavenly glory and set that aside to come and be born and placed in a horse trough where horses and cows eat their grain and their hay. That's where he was placed. He didn't come in no royal fashion. He came as humble as humble could be. And he came and he lived on this earth for 33 years, and he did it without failing God one single time in one single way, no way, shape, form, or fashion that he failed. He sinned not one single time, lived a perfect existence, kept God's law perfectly, and took our sins to Calvary and died for you and me and paid what we owe, paid what we could never pay, finished the job completely, died, rose from the grave. He did it for you and me. He gave every ounce of everything that he had for you and me. And he asked us, who've been redeemed from the horrors of hell, from the depths of sin to give our all for him. And I ask you this morning, how far off the mark are you? I'm not asking you that so you can answer me, but I'm asking you that. I want you to think about that right now. How far off from being all for Jesus are you? See, we can say it. Oh, yo, you know what? I'm all for Jesus. We can say those words. But how far off is our life from lining up with those words? That's a serious question. Because it does matter. And it will matter in the end. When we stand before our Lord, it will matter. If we were all in it for Him, or we were all for ourselves. It's the difference between standing before the Lord and Him being pleased with us, and us having His favor, and Him rewarding us and blessing us with crowns that we can take and and in worship, cast in His feet and say, Jesus, those are not mine. Those are yours. It was all for you. That's, That's what we're here to be. Versus standing before Him and seeing the shame that we have put upon his face in us. The Bible says we'll be ashamed before him 
at his coming. If we failed him, serve him. I don't want to see that reflected in the face of my Savior. I don't want to, as the Bible said, to stand there with a handful of ashes. Instead of having reward to throw back in worship at his feet, all I'll have is ashes if I've not given him all that I have. Oh, folks, please. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also, listen, that you receive not the grace of God in vain. We're asking you, those of us that work for God, we're asking you not to get saved and just live like it don't, it don't matter. Don't get saved and live as if it were all about because then your Christian life amounts to little and nothing. Realize this morning, no matter how no matter how bumpy life is, it's going to be bumpy one way or the other. No matter how hard it's going to be, it'll be a whole lot harder without God's help. Realize something. You ain't smart enough to figure it out without God. You ain't powerful enough to handle it without God. As Jesus said in John 5, without me, you can do nothing. Don't risk your Christian life on you. You put it all on Jesus. You give him all of you and ask him to teach you, ask him to guide you, ask him to control you, ask him to fill your life. Put it in his hands. Take it to his throne. Commit yourself to him and let him have you and you'll never have to apologize. You'll never regret that you turned it all over to him. That's by our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. Lord, we thank you this morning for the word of God. Father, I pray, Lord, for each one who's heard the message here in, in the room, Lord, and for those who listened in. Lord, I pray for my own self. Oh, Lord God, please, bring these thoughts before us daily. Lord, that you do not have to chasten us. Lord, that you don't have to humble us. Lord, may we humble ourselves. Lord, may we judge our own self that you don't have to bring judgment upon us. Lord, may we give ourselves willingly. Lord, that you don't have to take what's yours. Lord, may we come giving all that we are and putting it all in your hands. Father, I pray this morning for each one who's heard the message that we'd respond that we not let another one go by, that we not let another Sunday pass, another message, without heeding the message. Oh, Lord, I pray that you draw us closer than we've ever been. Holy Ghost, that you, that you create in us a thirst for the things of God and a distaste for the things of this world. We give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.